I want to thank uh, Aima, Ranjan Malik, Anita Matwani, and everyone in this room for including me in this very distinguished gathering of people. Um, time is one of the big constraints, so I won't dwell on that too much. Please start my time from now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Lincoln did not become president of America because he was born in a log hut. Narendra Modi was not, didn't become prime minister of India because he was a tea seller. Um, Lal Bahadur Shastri did not become prime minister because he was a teacher's son, or Ambedkar, the writer of the constitution, because he studied under lampposts. All of them recognize something within them that's superior to the circumstance that surrounds them and they did something about it. So motivation is a very important factor. What is it that actually motivates you to act on your realization? And my first insight is that adversity can be your biggest motivator. The second thing is moving in one direction is fine. As you go along, there's lots of things you do to get along, lots of things you, efforts you make to, to try and get ahead. And then there are things, whether you call it luck or you call it opportunity or you call it coincidence, something happens and that's an opportunity. Now, opportunity is a very strange thing. <coughs> it could be, um, an offer somebody makes you, which is quite obvious. It could be a conversation overheard at a bus stop. It could be um, a headline you read in a newspaper. The key is being able to recognize opportunity. Because as I said, opportunity doesn't come with marching brass bands. Um, and the, that ability to say, my God, this could be a massive opportunity is something that needs to be acted on. And to act on it, you need to be able to recognize the opportunity. So that's my second insight. Opportunities don't come with marching brass bands. Thirdly, when you reach a level of success, you think, ah, good, I've, I've, I've hit this one right, terrific. It's very important to see what else you can do, where else you can move from there. Because resting on your laurels can be dangerous. It can be stagnating. So for you to grow and your vision to grow and your, person and your, and your evolution to be complete, beyond success you have to look at what lies beyond that success and what else you can do. So my third insight is success is not an end. end. Success is not an end. There are other worlds to conquer. Now, there are stories behind these. Um, you know, coming back to the first insight, um, which was adversity can be your biggest motivator. My family was a remarkable family. My parents were Oxford educated. But they were very idealistic people. They fought for the freedom of the country. After independence, they chose spiritual paths. So even though they were intellectually and culturally very rich, economically, I won't say they're poor, but let's say lower middle class economically. And as a result, I had to, I, I got my admission to St. Stephen's College in Delhi, but I had to pay my way there, I had to work. So I worked with All India Radio and Television. And it was really hard because, you know, you were studying in the day and you were taking, um, uh, getting to the All India Radio and Television, which is just in its earliest days, etc. And it was tiring. And one day, while coming back from the uh, radio station, I was sitting in this auto. And, and as it was going along, it hit a real bad khadda. And my head banged violently against the Danda on top of the uh, auto. And I was in pain and furious. And I looked up and I saw this plane flying. 
I said to myself, one day corporations will fly me across the world. That was the anger that that, 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 that crash of the bar in the auto generated. But it also was my motivation. As a result, when I finished college, I came to the city where there were corporations, which is Bombay, Mumbai today, Bombay then. And that, in turn, led to my working with advertising, where I was worked for Ogilvy Mather and also Ogilvy Mather and also uh, Lintas uh, as their film chief. So corporations did fly me across the world for that period of time, at least all, all across India. And then I, I, I moved over to the film world uh, because I'd done a play and I was very sort of uh, in demand. I did a play called Tughlaq with uh, Alec Padamsi directed, which was one of the most successful plays at the time. I got offers from film. I took them and I entered the film industry. But I very quickly realized that unless I wanted to be a singing, dancing star, I better think of other worlds to conquer because I wasn't keen on singing and dancing. I had a, so I entered the industry. I had one very big hit film called Kachya Dhage with Raj Khosla directing, Vinod Khanna with me, signed up a film called Nagin. And then the Italians came to India looking for a character called Sandokan, which was going to be the lead of a television series in Italy. And they had come on a tour of Asia, looking at 10 cities in Asia to find Sandokan. And the first person they met in the first city they came to was me. And so they weren't about to make any decisions, but they'd wanted a tall, athletic, um, preferably bearded actor, and there I was, fitting the bill. And I was also, you know, considered hot at the time in terms of the buzz in the industry. And they said, will you come to Rome at your own expense to do a screen test? Now, I could have said, what nonsense, I'm an established actor, how dare you say at your own expense, you want to audition me, you fly me. That would be a very natural reaction, especially given the kind of adulation that, that, that surrounds success. But I said, no, no, I'll come, I'll come, no problems. So, because I was able to recognize that this might be a life-changing opportunity, and it was, because that series I went on to complete became the biggest hit in European television. Its TRPs have not been matched till today. People remember me for that series till today. Every generation in Italy and Europe has seen that series till today. And if I'd thrown pride and ego and said, no, no, pay for me to come, I'd have lost it. So the important thing is learning to recognize opportunity when you see it and doing what it takes to follow through. Then, when Sandra Khan became this incredible success, and this is my third point, success is not an end, there are other worlds to counter, uh, other worlds to conquer, became such a huge success that for me, success actually became a trap because it, it broke all the records, it, it, was, it made me a star in Europe in, 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 in short. And such a star, that I realized very quickly after talking to a few filmmakers that for all my success, Italy could not cast me in any other role. I was the quintessential, iconic Sandokan. And so, you make a nice social film and in walks Sandokan, it ruins your film. So success became a trap. I realized also that having reached this level of success, I couldn't build on it further in Europe. And what else remained? Either go back to India or push forward. So I said, let's go to Hollywood. So I went on to Hollywood. And not that it was easy, but I did have the kind of success that, that made me highly noticed. I did a film called Thief of Baghdad with Roddy McDowell and Peter Ustinov, Ashanti with Michael Caine and William Holden and Omar Sharif. Then the Bond film, uh, Octopussy opposite Roger Moore, where I played the villain. And this led to my being invited to be a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the, 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 the people that vote for the Oscars. And, 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 and this leads again to, to, to many other honors. Later I went on to do many other miniseries, many other 
um, an, uh, daytime and nighttime series like The Bold and Beautiful, etc., which ran for over a year, second most popular series in the world. But the fact is, the important thing was that I didn't try and rest on my success and say, okay, let me take a break, let me relax here. I pushed on. There are other worlds to conquer. And in Hollywood, I certainly was a working actor. I may not have been Hollywood's biggest star, but at the end of the day, to have established a career on three continents, um, starting out of Bollywood, going to Europe, going to America, I don't know about the visionary bit, but certainly I felt like a bit of a trailblazer because I was the first Indian that had actually done that, go from Bollywood to make careers abroad. And that, um, and that actually was the greatest satisfaction of all. And um, so those are my basic three insights that I want to share with you. Um, adversity can be your biggest motivator. Opportunities don't come marching with brass bands. And success is not an end. There are other worlds to conquer. Over to you. Successful st stories in the book, and I just did not want to miss this opportunity to <coughs> ask Ajay, uh, you know, firsthand and let all of you hear it from his mouth. You know, what is the success behind that story? So I'm just going to ask him three questions, Ajay. And I just didn't want to lose this chance. So one of the things that I noticed when I was writing that story, and I just thought I'll ask you so that people hear it straight from you. How are visionaries able to foresee a future that others just can't imagine? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to just uh, thank Mr. Anjan Malik, Nisha, for this opportunity, Aima. Uh, it's a privilege to be so, standing with you here and uh, you know, sharing the dais. Um, I mean, uh, it, it's not that, you know, one day, I don't know how it happens for others. I can only tell you yeah, what happened in it's my your, case. It's your story. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know that I belong to a trucking family in uh, my, I was born in Amritsar. And uh, dad was very passionate about uh, his trucking business. But when I, uh, you know, schooled in modern school in Delhi, then I went to Hindu college. Um, I, I knew that I had to join the family business and do something and prove myself. So that was the only little uh, sort of uh, motivation or sort of goal that I had. But I, I just knew that AT, the trucking company called ATC wasn't for me. So I was privileged uh, and uh, fortunate that dad had bought a cinema in 1978 uh, called Priya. And I was keen to prove myself. So I just, you know, so that there was no like massive grand vision. It was just like a mini vision, very small vision, that uh, you have lots of people you know, who like to watch movies. So India makes the highest number of films in the world, and we sell close to 3.5 billion tickets a year. So you have the, you know, the, uh, the demand side, and then you also make lots of movies. So yes, the supply and demand is there, and movies were glamorous, uh, larger than life. The whole format of storytelling uh, was very colorful. And I used to find the cinemas, with due respect to all the cinemas that were there in 19... Uh, late 1980s and early 90s, because the video boom was at its peak. They were very gray, very dark, very drab. Uh, nobody was wearing uniforms. The sound and projection wasn't very good, barring one or two here and there. So I thought if I could be that um, a very exciting conduit uh, between the film goers and the filmmakers, if we can make sure that the experience of uh, movie watching, which is so important to, the, uh, to all of us in India, can be really exciting. And uh, the transition from that world of make-believe uh, to reality can be smoothened a little bit. So it was too sudden. All of a sudden, when the lights came on, the movie went off, you had popcorns everywhere, and you again uh, got hit by reality. So I thought maybe, perhaps, if I improve the sound quality, the projection quality, the customer service, the ambience also make it colorful, vibrant, and everything, perhaps people will come back to the cinemas and not get impacted by video. That was the only little mini sort of a goal that I had uh, with the single screen cinema Priya. And I was fortunate that uh, the response was just tremendous. People loved the idea of seeing uniform staff, courteous staff, uh, getting fresh popcorn, fresh uh, cola, and good food, and you know, great sound and ambience. So that really, is, uh, really became the motivator then, because then I found my calling. My dad was happy, mom was happy, <laughs> family was happy. They said, wow, you know, there is a big trucking company which everybody's passionate about your grandfather started, but you, this little cinema that you took over, you've done something well with it, so what next? 
So I think that's what really, uh, I would say, happened in my case. I don't know whether other people uh, you know, have this grand vision straight away. I just had this little mini sort of a, a goal, which I was, with the grace of God, able to accomplish. And then from there on, uh, it encouraged me to do other things. And again, I was uh, fortunate that um, every little experiment that I did, it turned out to be OK. You know? And I was also very fascinated by people who only focus on one thing and not get carried away. Uh, by doing too many things. So I just realized that this is all I know. Uh, even if I can do a good job in this, I'll be happy. So I stuck to only one thing. I didn't do anything. I diversified a little bit later on, but I didn't do very well in that. So again, I came back to cinemas. So that's uh, been my journey. And uh, so it's not always about big vision. It can be about small goals as well, you know, yeah. and just being focused. Amazing. I'll just go with the next question. Uh, what drives a visionary? How do they keep themselves motivated in the face of extreme odds? And I'm sure in your experience and in your entire journey, there must be many challenges that you encountered. So how do you keep yourself going? Well, well as Mr. Bedi said that uh, you know, adversity plays an important role. Uh, so 92 was a very, uh, uh, you know, it was a big setback for me. My dad passed away suddenly. I was only 25 years old. Uh, then in 90, I had to go back to the trucking company. And in 94, again, we had a huge fire. We lost all the money. So I was very confused about this mini success that I had got in the cinema business. At the same time, I had to run the trucking company. And then the trucking company, again, I, I still believe in retrospect because it was a non-core activity for me. It was something I was not passionate about. And this uh, uh, warehouse uh, caught fire. Luckily, no human casualties happened, but we lost a lot of money. That really sort of propelled me to then go back and you know again introspect, speak to the family, speak to my mom. And my mom is still around fortunately, and she still continues to guide me. And she said, your heart is not here, Ajay, uh, in Punjabi, you know, <laughs> and uh, just, <laughs> just stick to uh, uh, cinema. That's what you love. And that's when, you know, I had seen some multiplexes abroad. I'd gone to Orlando uh, for my honeymoon, and, you know, I used to travel to the U.S., and I was just very fascinated that five to six films get released every week in India. And if you only have one house, you're stuck to that one movie. And it may do well, it may not do well, and your whole thousand seats for, multiplied by five shows in a day run empty. So there was a way to convert that one uh, thousand, twelve hundred seater cinema into a multiplex. But there were no building bylaws, there was nothing there. If I could do that, you know, then maybe people will come. I had my apprehensions that whether they'll come to smaller cinemas, smaller screens. But again, I felt that if you give good sound, good quality uh, projection system, maybe people will come. So I think. That, that two adversities, my dad sort of passing away, the fire, really propelled me uh, uh, to, to move forward and then say, okay, this is all I want to do. Opened the first multiplex in 97, again, did very well. Then the mall started happening, opened the first multiplex in a mall in uh, 2001. Then 2003, opened the largest multiplex in India in um, Bangalore, Forum Mall, which continues to get about 2.5 million people a year. And that's it, then one thing led to another. Your choice of locations, I know this question is out of syllabus, but your, your choice of locations, the fact that you decided to have cinema halls, you know, inside malls, you know, in places where there's a lot of traffic, this thing, how did you think of that? You know, why did that happen? I think traditionally, um, uh, you, d you don't make cinemas in the boondocks because you don't want to make it very inconvenient for people. So I like uh, the comfort of uh, demographics. Uh, heavy, uh, heavily populated catchments. Of course, you pay a higher rental because you're in, if you're in malls which are prime, if you're in locations which are CBD, then you pay a higher rental. But uh, I just think that gets offset by the number of people that you get then. So I was not very keen on going in far-flung places and trying to make it very inconvenient for people to come all the way, even if it's a destination mall. In the US, it happens a lot. You have your strip yeah. malls and people travel all the way. But in India, I just felt more comfortable. And I thought location, you know, when I went to Harvard, lots of studies were done by McDonald's, Starbucks, Walmart, uh, lots of uh, retail giants um, I studied. And location turned out to be the number one uh, choice for all retailers. And so we're nothing but a retailer of, uh, you know, basically exhibiting films. So I just felt that location is the key. And uh, so now we have about 118 locations all over the country, another 100 in the pipeline. And every single location has been handpicked by either me or my brother, even in Raipur, Bilaspur, Nanded, Aurangabad, Latur, uh, all the places where we are, B cities, A cities, tier two, tier one. And uh, so we just are very, very careful that wherever we put uh, capital, uh, 
uh, it must be something that gives you a good return. So it was never about uh, glamour and all that sort of stuff. It's a very serious business, <coughs> and uh, and we wanted to make sure we give a good return to the shareholders. We're a listed company. We've got investors, private equity. So we just can't get carried away by screen count. So we, with the grace of God, we do have the highest screen count in India, but it's never been about the screen count. It's always been uh, return on capital employed, return on uh, your investment. Therefore, get you know, make sure all the boxes get ticked. Thank you. Just last question from me. Uh, what happens once the visionary has achieved what he's set out to achieve? You know, I know you have a long way to go, but you know, for many others who are here in this hall, what you've achieved is a milestone by itself. You know, so what keeps propelling you to? you know, design new milestone and reach out for them? I think, again, uh, you know, it's I external stimuli. You're a listed company. You've got so many people who don't want to do, want you to get off the treadmill. <laughs> That's one thing. Yeah. And then the, and it's internal treadmill. I think just naturally, either you're somebody who like, or ha who's happy to rest on his laurels or you're somebody who wants to uh, get, re get restless. I get restless if, if you know, if, we, if I feel that... Um, you know, uh, we're getting complacent. So I really get restless. So we just opened our 15 screen complex, the largest in the country in Noida. And again, very fortunate, a lot of people came. It's a success. But I, I was just seeing everybody getting a little restless in the organization. So I just had to again, you know, sort of stimulate them all and tell them, listen, guys, whatever we have today can again get wiped out. Just make sure that you keep moving forward. I think it's, it's your nature becomes like that. That uh, I, it's not that I don't enjoy uh, if we meet with success. But I think one is internally, uh, I think all of us in, the, in our company has got the DNA now to uh, you know, not rest on our laurels and keep moving forward, look at the next challenge. And, um, and externally, we're a listed company. We just can't help it. Every quarter, we have to uh, continue to perform. If you don't quarter, they com uh, perform in one quarter compared to the last quarter, you get uh, hammered. So I think uh, so. both things uh, have kept us on our toes. Imagine people in the movie business getting hammered because you know you have Indians who just do not want to give up watching movies. You know, yeah. so so more power to you. Over to you, Ranjan. All right. So the next segment uh, is uh, the next segment is fresh insights. So you heard each other, and I'm sure you're inspired by each other's sharing. So I'll come to you, uh, Kabir. Uh, what's been what, uh, share one fresh insight that mm -hmm. happened out of listening to Ajay. Go ahead. Partly out of listening to Ajay, partly as a result of my own experience. But, you know, the fact that Ajay chose to be in the theater business rather than the trucking business means that he followed his heart. He did what, what he instinctively felt he wanted to do. So his passion was fully behind what goals he set himself. And that's the sign, according to me, of a creative mind, a creative mind that thinks beyond um, what is given. I don't care whether people are in uh, insurance, banking, marketing, cinema exhibition, whatever. All of us are creative people if we choose to be and choose to remain. And therefore, creativity has no end. It just keeps going. And you know, when I spent many years in LA. I spent a total of over 25 years outside India, although I kept coming and going and keeping in touch, but 25 years outside India. And never in all that time did I imagine that I would settle abroad. I knew I would come back to India. So about 10 years ago, I said to myself, Listen, just maybe it's time to look at getting back to India. Just go back for a year and see what the scene is, because lots of things could have changed. It might be not the country you remember. It might not be the lifestyle that you want, whatever. So I came back to India with a view to sort of writing a book and um, taking notes on my life and sharing my life experience, etc. And um, what happens is that in the life of a creative person, all kinds of new opportunities keep arising. Um, because Ajay is not just distributing films, he's also making films. He's also financing films. He's also making sure that from the beginning to the end, it's all there. And that's part of his creative growth uh, as a person, as a businessman. And what I discovered was that um, you come back here and then suddenly there's a fantastic play offered to you in Canada on the life of Shah Jahan, written by Canada's greatest playwright, uh, directed by Canada's greatest uh, 
opera director uh, called Taj, so I go off for that. That takes up two years of my life. Then there's a fantastic Italian series that comes up, so you go to do that. Then you come here and various things happen, and like today, I've had one film releasing on the 5th of August in America called Bazodi, which is a, a Caribbean music-infused uh, international film opposite a very famous um, singer called Marshall Montano. And then day after tomorrow, I have a really big film releasing, or big film releasing which in which I participate, uh, called uh, Mohenjo-daro. So that itself took another, of the last two years practically gone for that. So really speaking, the model of my story is creative people never retire. Because creative people will always find new avenues, new opportunities, new ways of expressing themselves. And if you are creative, the bottom line is you never need to retire. Thank you, Kabir. <laughs> Ajay, can we have your take, your final parting shot? Uh, no, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, in sync with uh, what Sir said just now, I think. Uh, um, I think you shouldn't, like he said, his success became a trap is something that he uh, mentioned just <coughs> now and he wanted to move, move, keep moving forward. He didn't want to come back and he got, uh, you know, this Italian character sir, that you played. Uh, you didn't want to come back, you want to move forward. So I think um, I identify with that a lot. I think it's important, as I said, that you need to um, not rest on your laurels. I'm repeating myself, but, and, uh, and the story only sort of uh, echoes, uh, you know, what I believe in as well. Thank you so much, uh, Kabir and Ajay, uh, for being here. Pildos, uh, can I invite you to, uh, to present to both the speakers uh, the books from the norm. Uh.